Hi, I'm Jamie at Horizon Productions, and in this video I'm going to go through the mix of the Rocket Girl song. If you want to watch the breakdown of the writing, then I'll leave a link down below that you can do that. I explain a bit about the background as well. So first I'll play through the song so you can hear it, and then I'll go through each element and show you how I processed it. Might as well start at the top, so I'll start with the lead vocals. I'll also talk a bit about the recording, like what microphones, what instruments and virtual instruments and things I used. What I'll do is I'll bypass everything. So I'll show you the raw vocal. I wanna fly past the clouds and the blue sky won't stop till I reach the stars. This is recorded here at the studio with an Aston Spirit condenser microphone on cardioid. 
And for processing, I'm starting with this. This is a focus right channel strip from Brainworks. And here I'm doing a little bit of high boost, a little bit of taking out some sort of boxy frequency here, and then a high pass filter. The way I kind of approach EQ is I listen to the source and then think about what it's missing and think about what's there that I don't want. And then I just go after those sounds. But I, on vocals, I really like this 15K shelf. And also there's a bit of compression. So I'll bypass each of these so I can show you what each part is doing. Past the clouds and the blue sky Won't stop till I reach the sky Past the clouds and the blue sky Won't stop till I reach the sky Past the clouds and the blue sky Won't stop till So that's the EQ, so you can hear what each is doing. I'll just, uh, I'll just bring that in and out. Past the clouds and the blue sky Won't stop So let's just help making it a bit clearer. And then adding some compression. This compression is really just a bit of level control because I've got another compressor, which I'll come to in a minute. I wanna fly Past the clouds and the blue sky won't stop till I reach the sky. So yeah, just controlling a little bit of the level, sort of evening things out a little bit. I like to use slur attacks. I think this is somewhere around 30 milliseconds, yeah. This is so that if there's any plosives, the compressor doesn't clamp straight down on it. And then I can use a limiter later just to control those plosives and extra peaks. And the release is, what, 200 milliseconds or so? Two to one, quite gentle. Next, I like to use this on vocals a lot. This is Klanghelm MJUC. And I like using this interstage button. This I find adds a certain character and I'll bring this in and out so you can see what I mean, but slow attack, medium-ish release. And it sounds like this. I won't fly past the clouds and the blue sky I'll just bring this into stage in and out I wanna fly past the clouds and the blue sky won't stop I find that it sort of gives a nice presence boost to the voice. Then I'm using frequency to control sibilance, essentially as a de I wanna fly past the clouds and the blue sky. Won't stop till. So you can see as the S's come in, this just ducks a little bit. I prefer to do this than using a de because I feel I have more control. And then there's just a limiter on the end of this, and this is just to catch peaks, really. Then I have some effects on this as well, and I'll show you that. I'll have to turn off this automation. First, Studio Reverb. This is Nimbus, and I'm using this on the Studio One preset. This is just to add a little ambience, a little room ambience. My room is quite dry, so this just adds a nice little bit of ambience around the voice. Also, because the voice is recorded in mono, it can add a bit of stereo information too. So I'll bring that in. I wanna fly past the clouds and the blue sky. And that's on, I think, throughout the whole song. It doesn't turn off. It's just there as, as I say, just to add a bit of room kind of sound to it. Then a vocal delay. This is a delay I use if I want to sort of add the sense of reverb, but without getting too cloudy. So one side 180, the other side 220, just one repeat, and then rolling off some of the top and bottom end. And that sounds like this. 
I wanna fly past the clouds and the blue sky. Just adding a little bit of depth and again stereo width. Then this effects reverb. And this is Realm. This is an algorithmic reverb, very spacious sounding. I really like feeding instruments into this and then using it as another texture, which I have actually done in this track. I wanna fly past the clouds and the blue sky. Then I've got a quarter note delay. This again, adding space. And that sounds like this. I wanna fly past the clouds and the blue sky. And lastly, this is a medium chamber. Again, Nimbus set on the medium chamber preset. Sounds like this. I wanna fly past the clouds and the blue sky. And all of these effects are on during this first section. And that sounds like this. I wanna fly past the clouds and the blue sky. Just to give you a before and after of both of those, the inserts and the sends. I wanna fly past the clouds and the blue sky. That's the lead vocal. Moving on to one of the backing. So raw. Sounds like this. Same again. I'm using very similar settings for all the vocals. Because it's the same voice, it kind of makes sense to. No compression here though. Just adding a bit of air, taking out some of the boxiness in the low mids. And then the effects reverb on this. <laughs> Similar thing happening with this string harmony Starting with the EQ, slightly less high end on this, and a little bit of low end, I'll, I'll show you what this is, and some compression. So I just felt that it needed a little more of this, I'll play that once more. And then a little bit of compression here. So that's just a control level. MJUC again. And a few effects. So using the effects reverb. Uh, this is one I haven't shown yet, scoring stage. So this is an effect I use when I do orchestral stuff. So that along with another reverb I use to get my orchestral room sound. So I'll play that one. And this is reverence which is 
a convolution reverb that comes with Cubase, and I'm using the LA scoring stage preset that comes with it. With the other two, effects reverb and the medium chamber. Similar kind of thing for the string harmony bridge. Pretty similar settings again. So I'll just turn them off and bring them in, just so you can hear it raw. The ending harmony vocal sounds like this. As I touch down onto my First of all, focus right channel strip again. As I touch down onto my Then MJUC. Frequency for sibilance control, I won't play this. And then the multi-tap delay, which comes with Cubase. This I'm using mainly for this ducking feature. As I touch down, down, down my... So what this does is when audio is running through it, it lowers the volume of the delay. And then how long it returns to regular volume is determined by this here. So in this case, 275 milliseconds. There's also this erase delay line at ducking start. This clears the memory of the delay when a new signal comes in. I'll just play this and you'll see what I mean. As I touch down, down, down onto my... So hopefully you should have heard there that on the onto Mars line, the delay suddenly disappeared and then started again. And then this also has the medium chamber on it. As I touch down, down, down onto These settings are pretty much the same. I think there's only a slight difference here. So I won't bother breaking down each effect, but this is what it sounds like. I'll just play it raw and then with effects. Moving on to the kids' choir, it sounds like this. Rocket girl. I don't know what microphones we use for this. It was recorded at their respective houses. First, I'm putting frequency on to tame a bit of this harsh frequency up here. Rocket girl. And I think I did this after I added the high shelf because it was adding a little too much of that frequency. Focus right, channel strip again, bit of top end, a little bit of bottom end at 270. This adds a bit of chesty weight to the sound. High pass at 105 and then pulling out some 200. And there's also some gentle compression here. Rocket 
Then MJUC. Rocket Go. And the medium chamber and the effects reverb as well. Rocket Go. And then the on a journey part is the same except for slightly different effects. This medium chamber and the vocal delay. I'm on a journey to find my place. It's a bit dry during that section. Moving on to instruments. Celeste, I'll show you what this is. This is an SFZ player from Plogue. And I'm just using one I found on the internet called Vintage Celesta. And this is by Michael Pitcher. I think I'm saying that right. P-I-C-H-E-R. I'll leave a link down below if I can find it. And yeah, I thought this sounded quite good. I've been using this for quite a while. And I'll play what that sounds like raw. I'm using the Shep's Omni channel on here. High pass filter a little bit, around 100 by the look of it. A little top end boost, 8K. A little upper mid range as well, 5K. This is probably the sort of higher end kind of tinkly part I wanted to push out a little bit. Pulling out some mid range thing at 958. So just to show this actually quickly, have a look here. There's all this sort of noise down here that on smaller speakers you might not hear this, but it does sort of build up over several tracks. So just controlling that a little bit. It just helps clean everything up a little bit. So I just solo each of these bands. Very tinkly upper range. The upper end brightness of those hammers. And a small bit of dissonance there. So I just AB that one more time. And then scoring stage and medium chamber on this. I think also at the end I bring in this effects reverb as well. So I'll show you that in a second. Here, yeah, so it comes in. So that's just helping it blend in with the other instruments that have that same effect. Just add that, again, spaciness around the beginning and end. Piano. This is Verve, which came with Cubase 12, but I think you can buy it as a third party instrument from Steinberg, if you check their website. And what's interesting about this is it has this texture section, which I didn't use, but you can add a texture on top of it. So you have the piano and the texture, strings, bell sounds, that sort of thing. But it's a felt piano at its core. And it sounds like this. Here I'm using Shep 73. I like to use this for the 4.8 band on piano because I feel it kind of pushes the piano forward a little bit. So there's some 12K shelf, 4.8, and then I'm high passing at 80. This, this high pass filter has a little bump around the corner of the filter. So it can bring a little bit of the low end back even though you're taking some out. 
I'll play this without and then with. So you really see how this 4.8 really pushes the piano forward. Bit of frequency. Obviously I felt there was a little bit too much in this area. Yeah, so that, that was possibly something I did after. I may have noticed that in the context of everything else and felt that was sticking out a bit too much, so I just pulled that out with a bit of EQ. And this has the scoring stage on it. And at the beginning and end, again, with the effects reverb. Next, let's look at the Space Choir. This is created in a granular synthesizer called Pad Shop, and this comes with Cubase as well. This was added way back. I can't exactly, maybe seven, uh, the first version came out. And all I did was bounce the piano track and import it in here, and then just choose this little bit here. And I just messed around with the controls until I came up with something I like the sound of. There's also a reverb effect here. If you, get rid of that and I'll just uh, I'll just play this on its own it's got quite that choppy granular sound with the reverb It smooths that out a little bit. And I bounced that to audio, and I added, first of all, RC20. This is just to provide some more movement. I'm using the wobble and the distortion and magnetic, and then a little bit of filtering here as well. So I'll bring these each in, and I'll show you what they're doing each individually. And then a little bit of filtering here. That's going into Realm, which smooths it out a lot. Apologies for the little clicks and crackles. Sometimes when you turn things on and off, that happens. And then I just used a basic EQ, lots of top end, pulled out, I guess, some mud here and a low end roll off. So yeah, probably a bit too much build up around that area that I decided to pull out. And that has the effects reverb and the medium chamber on top of it. At the end, we have this sub bass. This sits under the space choir thing. And this was made using Retrolog. This is another synth that comes with Cubase, and you can buy it as a third-party instrument. 
And again, this was added way back. I can't even remember. But it's just a simple sine wave. I think this is a triangle. And then, yeah, just very rolled off, bit of distortion. And it sounds like this. So that may be a little bit low if you have earbuds or small speakers. But if you have like a sub or something, you should be able to hear that. It's just there to provide some thickness and making the ending feel a bit more grounded because now we're back on Earth. And I'm just pulling out some 35 just to control that, 24 decibels per octave. So again, you probably won't hear that, but yeah. This has also got a bit of modulation, chorus, small bit of delay and reverb. Ukulele. This was recorded here at the studio by Yasmin. And I recorded this using a SE1A small diaphragm condenser microphone, pencil condenser. And raw sounds like this. And the first thing I'm doing is a little bit of noise reduction. I can't hear it now, but apparently it had some noise on it. <laughs> so that's just doing this. Then I'm using this again. High shelf at 4.7 to add some brightness. Quite a high roll off, 185-ish. 160 to bring a bit of body in and pulling out some 200. Small bit of compression. This is mainly to control the peaks and I'll come to something else I had to do as well for that. Yeah, really opening it up, making it bright, making it cut through. Then to control some of the peaks, I'm using this clipper. Essentially this distorts the transients so that they round off a little bit. So it can help soften some of those more aggressive transients. Just as a side note, at the beginning I added an envelope shaper and this took off even more because it was extra spiky the way she was playing it. I just used this to take off some of that extra transient. And I'll show you without them with. Because I think I was finding that extra aggressive transient was making the reverb do weird things. So I just took it off a little bit. And then in terms of reverb, I'm using the studio reverb. just to give a bit of room tone around it. And then the effects reverb I'm using at the beginning so it fits in with the rest of that spacey sound. And just to see what that sounds like without that envelope shaper just taking off the peak. Yeah, it's subtle. But it's a little more controlled, I think. Electric guitar. This is a amp modeler. And it's the PRS Dallas amp from Waves. I really like this on clean guitar. It's sort of, for me, it's somewhere around a Fender-y sort of Vox sort of sound. And it's got a nice spring reverb on it. And I'll play what that sounds like. I'll play you the DI first. So it's just a DI'd guitar. Telecaster style guitar. Yep, sounds like a DI. <laughs> and then I'll put the amp on that.
And I'll just show that with a bit of cranked reverb so you can hear that. Yeah, I always thought this sounded pretty authentic. I also, when I record guitar with a virtual amp, I like to put the effects in the front as if I was doing that for real. So I just added this vibrato. So that's just adding a little bit of movement. It's very kind of shallow and also a delay. So on the plex setting, eighth note, quite a low mix. That is then bounced to audio, and that sounds like this. Pan to the left channel. First thing is a gate, and this is to get rid of some of the noise between notes and things like that. Then using an EQ. Big old boost on the top, taking out some low end. Bit of compression. This is to control mainly the attacks and uh, even it out a little bit. And then finally, the effects reverb and a delay as well. This is just a standard mono delay with no repeats, filtering off a lot of the top end and a little bit of the bottom. And this is here to, if I just show you, here's the delay. It's panned all the way to the right, and the electric guitar is panned to the left, slightly, 50%. And what this does for me is it evens out the stereo spread and balances a little bit. So you get a bit of guitar in both rather than recording it twice. So I'll show that. And this delay is also going into the effect reverb. And then adding the effects reverb on the guitar. Acoustic guitar picked, we'll just grab a little bit here, uh, I don't know, somewhere here. This sounds like this raw. So I think this was recorded with the SE1A again, using a little bit of EQ, dynamic EQ again I think, just to take out some boxiness down here. So it evens it out a bit. Then I'm using a big boost on the top with the uh, SSL EV2 from Waves, Black Knob. That sounds like this. Well, that's sort of strummed part is to try and bring it out and getting rid of some of that low end as well. I'm just using a brick wall limiter just to catch some peaks if it gets a bit out of control. No effects apparently. Apparently I didn't think I needed it. Um, and then there's these stereo acoustic guitars here and these sound like this. Using the SSL again, boosting some top end at about 7.44 and a little high pass at 53. And then studio reverb, just a bit of rim tone.
vibraphone. This is quite old sample. This is from Hallian Symphonic Orchestra, and it sounds like this. All I'm doing here is adding a little bit of EQ. And I assume doing the similar thing to the Celeste here. This is pulling out some of the some of the sort of upper hammer quality. And then a bit of boxiness down here. And pulling out some low end. That's then got the scoring stage and the medium chamber as well. Tubular bells, same again, Hallian Symphonic Orchestra, sounds like this. And again, pulling out some bottom end and also some of that boxy frequency. Scoring stage and medium chamber. Strings. These again, Hallian Symphonic Orchestra. Uh, let's go for, yeah, let's go for the end bit. So these individually have e EQ, and I'll just take you through that. So I'm using the Shep 73, a little bit of top end, pulling out some 4.8 on this, and high passing at 80, so violin's one. Violins two, same thing. Violas, lots of top end. Again, pulling out that 4.8, little boost in the low range and then 50 Hertz high pass. Finally, the cellos, small bit of top end, bit of 110, and a high pass at 50. Now all of these, all of the strings are going through separate reverb sends because I wanted to simulate the idea of them being in a hall so violins one would be closer to the microphones than violins two, so there would be less reverb. And so on for the violas and cellos, depending on where they are relative to the microphones. But then I put an overall EQ on this, top end boost, pull out some 110, and that sounds like this. Bass, I just grab a bit here. This is a Squire MB4 with Seymour Duncan pickups. And it's just a DI straight into, this is the stock Cubase amp modeler for bass, just called Bass Amp, VST Bass Amp. And I'm using the Greyhound model with a bit of overdrive on the front end. So I'll show you that raw and then with the actual amp.
So on the bass, first of all, gate. This is just a control kind of noise between notes. And then using the SSL again, this time on the brown knob, boosted a little 1.5, a little bit of 900 looks like. I usually boost between seven and nine on bass to bring out some of that upper mid range of the bass. And then a bit of 130, high pass at 50-ish, and a little bit of compression at three to one ratio. That sounds like this. I'll, I'll bring the EQ in separately. So you can hear what each of those moves is doing. And then a little high pass just to get rid of some of the really low stuff. And then a little bit of compression. Which is just, again, to even things out a little bit. And then drums. Drums is always a big subject. Uh, let's just uh, let's go to the end here. So these are recorded at the studio. The drum kit is a Sonor Sonic Plus. Came out in the 90s, I believe. And I'm using a sort of a rock setup. 12 by 9 inch rack tom, 16 by 16 inch floor tom. The bass drum is 20 by 16. Drum heads, Emperor coated on the top of the toms, Ambassador clear on the bottom. P3 clear on the bass drum and just the standard logo head on the resonant side. There's a pillow in the bass drum and the beater is a felt beater. The hi-hat I'm using is a Peisty Signature Sound Edge hi-hat, 14 inch, and then the Crash is an 18 inch full crash, also from Peisty Signature Series. I'll start with the room mic as it's here. That sounds like this. This is a pair of Golden Age Project R1 Mark III active rib microphones. And they're in a Blumline pair a few meters in front of the drum set. And then what I did was a little bit of top end. I kind of treated these, because there's not much cymbals going on, I kind of treated these more like overall drum sounding, just like the overheads actually, I sort of an overall drum sound. So boosting some top end at 6.82, let's probably get some attack out, and then 600, pulling out some boxiness, a little high pass, and a little bit of compression as well. Oh, and I'm, I'm also pushing the mic preamp just to get some harmonic distortion out of it as well. And then a bit of compression. The other thing I'm doing is using this extra wide. Blumline pair can sometimes sound a bit narrow, but sometimes I like it a little wider, so I'm using this extra wide setting as it's here. So if this is normal, it sounds like this. So it just makes it sound a little bit wider. And you can get too extreme with this kind of thing. And it can start to sound a little bit weird. But you know, for, for an effect, if you're going for an effect, that's, that's something you could do. And then I like to use this to really crush things. This is almost like an 1176 all buttons in mode on steroids. It's quite aggressive. And this is from Native Instruments. And it has a certain sound about it, but it can get pretty, pretty aggressive on extreme settings like this. So yeah, <laughs> and I've also dialed back the 
the mix a little bit just so it's it's not too overbearing. If it was 100% wet, So it just controls that a little bit, just adds a little more size to the room. My room's not particularly big or big sounding, so it's quite a controlled environment. So doing that gives a bit of size. Next, the overheads. These are Aston Spirits. This is a picture of the drum setup and the microphone placement. So the overheads are in front of the drums and slightly leaning forward. And the reason I started doing this was the capsules and microphones aren't facing towards the cymbals as much, so you don't get as much spitty, sibilant, and harsh cymbal sound. I'm only using one cymbal on this, apart from the hi-hat, so it's not so much of an issue in this particular case, but it can help tame some harshness of the cymbals when you're recording with cymbals. In this case, I'm just using them as an overall drum sound setup. So the overhead sounds like this. And I've got in phase on here. This is just to time align the left and right channel so I don't get too far out. And then the SSL again. And it looks like I'm mainly using this compression to control the peaks a little bit. Didn't go too aggressive on it. Kick inside mic, sounds like this. This is a D112 from AKG. I'm using a gate just to control some of the bleed. And one thing I like to do is not just get rid of all the bleed, use this range control to just control some of it rather than take it all away. I find it helps make the drum set sound blended. And then SSL again. So getting rid of some of the boxiness and also boosting some of the beta attack. And then compression. Which adds a little punch and then taking out some of the low lows with the high pass. Then a sub kick. This is made from a broken bass cab speaker. I just glued a bit of cardboard box onto it to repair it and wired a TS cable on it. That goes into a DI box and it sounds like this. Very low, but it adds the low end to the kick. What I did to that was use in phase to align it to the kick and also just rolled off all that top end I didn't want. Now you may not be able to hear that again because it's quite low. If I put that with the kick drum and I'll just bring that in and out so you can see what that does. Hopefully you'll be able to hear this if you listen to it on decent speakers or headphones. So you should be able to hear that's adding just some weight to the bottom. I prefer to do that than try and boost loads of low end into the inside kick mic. Both of those are going into a bus. So I'm doing a bit of time alignment again. And then that is going into this clipper. This is just adding a little saturation to the attack. And this can help the kick cut through. Toms, these were both recorded with a 57. SM57 from Shaw, time alignment again, and then a gate. So I used a gate on the rack tom because it only plays every so often. And sometimes like, I mean, the best way to do this is to go through and just 
edit out everything that isn't Tom's. That takes time, and when it's playing enough that it's like, yeah, I just decide to use a gate. So that sounds like this. That's just controlling some of that bleed. Again, not trying to get rid of it completely. And then SSL channel strip again. Here I'm mainly pulling out the mid range, but I added a little attack and boosted a bit of lows as well. Compression to add a little attack again. Floor tom, essentially the same kind of thing. Slightly different settings because it's a lower drum. And no gate on this because it's playing pretty much all the time. And then I obviously felt there was a little too much of this and not enough of this. So that's what this sounds like. Both of them are going into a bus as well. This again, classic clipper. This is just controlling the peaks and saturating them a little bit. So what I'll do is I'll play the drums before I get onto the drum effects. I'll just play the drums with and without effects so you can hear what all that did. I'm also using a couple of drum reverbs here. This one is Nimbus. I've been liking this Live Room 10 on drums for a little while. And I've just got a blend of things going on into that. It's not particularly big sounding. And then controlling a little bit and bringing some of the low end out. Yeah, so I guess it was getting a little clicky there for me, a little smacky. And then I like to treat my reverbs like as if they were a recorded drum room, so I'm using this again. Supercharger. Second drum room. Reverb. This I'm using Reverence again. And this is, I think this is a Bracasti impulse response. So I've always quite liked that. Looks like I just took out the low end on this. Obviously felt it was getting a little too tubby down there. And same again, just using Supercharger to add a bit of size. If I play those drum rooms together, they sound like this. It's just adding a bit of size and ambience to the drums. Because recorded in a small room, I want to make them sound a little bigger. And then I'm also using a bit of parallel compression here. And for this, again, using Supercharger. It 
So at the end, I've got it the most aggressive and a little bit here, it pushes up during this section. So I obviously wanted the drums a little more forward on that section. And it's a, it's kind of a good way, rather than turning the drums up, you can just use parallel compression to just push that up. It brings a bit of energy and also a bit of volume and then back it off. So useful little trick. And also just to point out, I put my drum reverbs through the drum bus as well. I, I treat them actually like drum rooms. So on the drum bus, I've got a bit of an EQ. I'll bring this in. So this is adding a little attack and this is taking out a little bit of the mud. Then Buster SE from Analog Obsession. This is similar to an SSL type bus compressor. Reasonably fast attack, a medium-ish sort of release, four to one. Sounds like this. Around about four decibels of gain reduction. It's just adding a bit of aggression, a bit of attack and the lows are being high passed a little bit as well. This turbo button also, I think it allows the compressor to respond to the entire spectrum rather than a filtered spectrum. I think that's what it does. And that's the drums. Moving on to the percussion parts, shaker, not much to talk about here. So there's a lot of build up down here and I'm using this high pass filter just to get rid of that. And honestly, I feel like that's all I needed to do. And there's also studio reverb on this. And that's again, just to add some space around it. Rack is exactly the same, just pulling some low end out. and the studio reverb. Tambourine, just a high pass filter. Yeah, so. And then I'm also adding a gate and this just, rather than going through and editing every single hit out, I just decided to use a gate. So you don't get any sort of noise between each hit. Using the Cubase tube compressor as well. This is to control some of the attacks. Tambourines can get a little spiky. I'm guessing here after the tube compressor with the distortion, I, maybe I was bringing back too much low end. Let's have a look. Oh yeah. Yeah, so I obviously felt like the tube compressor did a bit of a number on the uh, low end. Okay, rim click. This again, removing the low end. I can hear a little low hum. Especially in my right headphone. So I'm just removing that. And then frequency, adding a little attack on the top. And then Magneto is a tape saturation plugin that comes with Cubase. And this, I guess I just wanted to add a little bit of harmonics to it. And Studio Reverb.
claps. This is what they sound like raw. And I essentially just played this through clapping six times and then combined them to make a sort of crowd clapping thing. First of all, doing the usual removing a bit of low end here. Just to clean up some low frequencies. Then using the tube compressor to add some saturation and a bit of attack. and a brick wall limiter to control the levels so that some of those attacks don't become overbearing. Just helps even things out. And then the studio reverb for some ambience. And that helps blend it in with the other percussion. And almost there, I'm just gonna, there's one thing I wanna point out for each of these. I did a little bit of EQ prior to adding the reverb. I'll play the reverb with everything in and you'll hear how the different reverbs sound. But then I'll show you what this EQ is doing as well. So that's the studio reverb. Scoring stage. The medium chamber. Looks like I didn't do anything on the EQ on that one. And then the effects reverb. And I'll find the section with that. And then just for fun, I'll just add all the reverbs together. And that just gives you an idea of the tonality of the reverbs and how they fit in with the rest of the sound. Just a word on automation. I'm turning effects on and off throughout the track. For example, on the vocals, if the line is down, it means it's off. And if the line's up, it means it's on. So throughout different sections here, different effects come in and out. This can add interest and make sections sound more unique as we go through. Verses and choruses could be treated differently, things like that. Also, level automation. I like to use a gain plugin, and the one I use is just the Kilo Hearts one. Very simple. And this is just something I've been doing for a while, where I use the gain plugin to control the levels, and then I could still use the fader to turn things up and down overall if I choose to. It's just something I do. And also, I might have parts that I just want to push up and down, uh, perhaps in the strings. Yeah, so here the violas are pushing forward a bit just to bring that line out, bringing back some of this violin too on this bit. It just helps balance things as you go through. So if there's an instrument doing a line, like say a piano line, and you want to just bring that out, you can turn it up and then turn it back down and go back into the background. Lastly, just to look at the master bus. I'm using this as a limiter to just 
make sure things don't go over maximum level. And I use an output of minus one just to stop intersample clipping. Now, I'm not sure if this plugin detects that, but it's just a habit I've gotten into with limiters just to stop intersample clipping happening. As in, when the waveform is converted back to analog, it may go over zero and cause distortion. So this just makes sure that doesn't happen. Although a lot of limiters these days and maximizers have intersample clipping detection, so it's not so much of an issue. First on the chain though, I'm using frequency just to pull out some of this frequency here. Somewhere, you know, th two to three, three to five, that sort of region can get a little congested and make things sound muddy. Just pulling a bit of this out can help bring some clarity. On to Mars, there is something rising in my heart. Though I flow on Then CQ, and this I'm using just for the high shelf, just to add a bit more brightness I felt it needed. Bus dress E for my bus compression. Three millisecond attack, 300 millisecond release, ratio of three to one, and a bit of this high pass filter on the side chain, and then turbo mode on as well. This is to help glue the tracks together a little bit. On to Around four decibels of gain reduction I usually aim for with this. And yeah, I think that's it. It's always interesting to go back and see what I did and also compare it to what I do now. Because there are some slight differences in how I approach things, but in later breakdowns, you'll probably see that. Over time, your approach probably will change. And it's interesting to see what you did and even maybe take ideas from what you used to do and use them now. Like, oh, I remember doing that. And then... Yeah, applying that to newer projects. So I hope you enjoyed this and got something out of it.